welcome you to our today's AIS talk. The Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy uh, tries to bring you some information on one of the hotspots of the world. Uh, and I especially want to welcome, of course, our today's guests. And I will start with uh, Professor Anders Oslund. A heartily welcome to you, Professor. Professor Oslund uh, is a senior fellow of the Stockholm Free World Forum and also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Uh, his doctor's de degrees he made at Oxford University, and then he had a diplomatic career uh, from the Swedish state being in Kuwait, in Poland, in Geneva, and also in Moscow. Uh, he became a senior adv advisor and cooperator for many uh, American think tanks and also European think tanks, and especially also uh, an advisor for many governments, especially also the administration of Russia and the administration uh, of Ukraine. And he is seen as one of the really leading uh, economists and uh, specialists for financial questions in Eastern Europe. A heartly welcome to you, Professor. Uh, you are talking from Washington. And uh, of course, we also want to hear uh, quite a bit about your experiences in the last days uh, from the American administration. Next to him, we uh, our guest today, one of the board members of uh, the Austrian Institute for European uh, and Security and uh, for <laughs> European and Security Policy. Uh, it is Ambassador Martin Seidig, who has a long career. He worked privately uh, in Moscow. Uh, he was not only a diplomat in Moscow, but also ambassador, Austria's ambassador in China and uh, in New York for uh, United Nations. And he was a special envoy of OEC in the last years uh, in Ukraine. And therefore, I think we really have two outstanding specialists and we try to complete it also with our director, Velina Chakharova, who has specialized uh, also in Eastern politics and in uh, great power politics. And if you allow, I would like uh, to start immediately uh, well with uh, the nowadays situation. I mean, if we are looking to the military situation in Ukraine, you can say uh, that obviously Moscow has not achieved its military goals uh, in the way of a blitzkrieg. Uh, it has overcome or has occupied the second biggest city uh, of Kharkiv, but only had, has the control over areas in the east and in the south, uh, but not yet the capital and practically nothing in the western part of Ukraine. And therefore, my first question is uh, ambassador to Ambassador Seidig, Ambassador how do you see the actual political situation in Ukraine, in Europe, and beyond? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being invited and for being part. Um, the actual situation uh, in uh, Europe is uh, astonishing. Uh, we have seen um, a very great, I would say, even unexpected unity among European countries, Western European countries, among uh, the uh, uh, European Union. And uh, that uh, can be seen in the way uh, how fast uh, sanctions were adopted and are being implemented against Russia. And uh, there is a great unity, I would say also, in all uh, the uh, political statements uh, that one can hear from Europeans. So uh, this is a, a very interesting and uh, development, and uh, probably we, our, we Europeans ourselves, 
would not have foreseen. If we look to Ukraine, uh, the president uh, is, uh, President Zelensky uh, is uh, very much in power. Um, he is, uh, uh, I think, gaining uh, even more popularity. Let's not forget that three years ago, Zelensky was uh, uh, voted in president with a majority of 73% against the incumbent uh, Poroshenko. Um, and uh, in completely free and fair democratic elections. Um, and uh, the incumbent president, uh, Poroshenko, uh, who um, had not only his own financial you know, uh, resources uh, to have a campaign, uh, but also uh, had uh, you know, five years of uh, presidential rule, uh, but uh, was defeated um, and was defeated very clearly by Zelensky. And Zelensky, who has not been taken serious <clears throat> in Moscow, in, in uh, Moscow one sees him always as an actor of uh, a comedian, uh, but not uh, a serious politician. Now, uh, Zelensky is a, serious, is a politician to, con to be considered seriously. And in this very special moment, Zelensky can draw on his experience as actor because he is now uh, every day again on the social media, on TikTok, on Telegram, and they do it extremely well. And uh, uh, Zelensky is very convincing and uh, is a force that one has to reckon with. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, just uh, yesterday, uh, the spokesperson, uh, the Russian spokesperson, Peskov, uh, said that he sees Zelensky as the legitimate president of Ukraine. Um, and that's an important statement uh, uh, that we uh, have to uh, take into account. Uh, the way uh, Putin had talked about uh, a Ukrainian politics before, one would not have seen or believed that, uh, uh, that uh, Zelensky will be seen as the legitimate president. And also an interesting statement by Peskov lately uh, was um, uh, in, in a reaction to uh, the Ukrainian uh, request to become a member of the European Union. Peskov said that uh, he, uh, Russia does not consider the, Euro the European Union to be a military alliance and uh, did not uh, oppose, did not say anything against uh, the uh, Ukraine uh, asking uh, mem for membership. We all know uh, that uh, this would be an extremely long process uh, to become a member of the European Union with the European Union not even being able to solve uh, the membership request uh, of Montenegro. But still, it is an interesting reaction that we have to uh, consider. And let me make one uh, a final statement as to also to the, uh, the military side. Uh, it is important to note that uh, in, uh, in the east of the country, uh, Mariupol is still not taken by uh, the uh, Russian uh, forces or the joint Russian and separatist forces. And there is still fighting going on uh, in the area north of uh, uh, in, in uh, Lugansk Oblast, uh, with uh, an area not taken uh, by uh, the Russian military. So even in the east of the country, there is still fighting going on and considerable fighting going on. And maybe I will come then later uh, to the question, what are the expectations of Russia? There was an interesting statement by Putin in a telephone conversation yesterday with the Venezuelan president Maduro. Putin needs the Venezuelan president uh, seemingly to be uh, one of the few who still talk to him um, and uh, to make a statement of what are the military, what, what are the political expectations from the Russian side. But about this maybe later. Yeah, thank you uh, for this first statement. Uh, for sure, it is surprising for most Europeans and maybe uh, by far beyond, this uh, power of fighting, uh, fighting power of uh, Ukrainian forces on the one hand, but also this united Ukraine politically, obviously. And it's also certainly surprising uh, the unity in Europe and also the solidarity 
of European countries. And insofar, I would like now uh, to ask Professor Oslund, how is the situation from the American side? How do you, do you see the situation and uh, what are your impressions on uh, the US politics in this situation? Well, the short answer is that the United States is uh, fully united behind Ukraine. Uh, and the question is rather how much uh, will the US do for Ukraine? Uh, so far now, in one year, uh, the US has provided $1 billion to Ukraine. It now provides a lot of uh, uh, <clears throat> military material, uh, and uh, in particular ja uh, javelins and the tank weapon. Uh, stingers are not coming directly from the US, but they are coming from other uh, <clears throat> allies. And uh, the US allow all kinds of the military material now. Uh, previously, the US has provided about $400 million a year. So this has been a big uh, uh, step forward. And of course, President uh, Biden yesterday concentrated his speech on Ukraine. And it fits very well with his idea that uh, uh, he is now standing up fighting the international uh, kleptocracy uh, identified as, uh, as Russia uh, for uh, democracy and uh, uh, freedom. So uh, for President Biden, this uh, <clears throat> agenda uh, suits him very well. Currently, the administration is discussing a far bigger program for Ukraine. They're discussing $6 billion for next year. And I think that the U.S. would, after whatever happens, and uh, if Ukraine remains uh, independent, they will uh, pr provide a big financial uh, package. The worry here is that uh, uh, they think that uh, Putin might suspect that NATO gets drawn in uh, to uh, the war. In particular, it's the <clears throat> responsibility to protect that the Americans are afraid of. Therefore, President Biden himself is saying time and time again that the US and NATO will not uh, be drawn in because as uh, uh, Ambassador Seidek uh, said, uh, the, uh, the Kremlin does not take the European Union seriously. It takes the US and NATO very seriously because this is real military strength. So this is a major effort that is being uh, done here. And of course, it's a question where are the dangerous issues? Right now, Poland, uh, Slovakia, and Bulgaria are about to deliver fighter planes uh, to, to Ukraine. Rather, Ukrainian pilots are coming to pick them up. This is clearly something that worries the Russians uh, a great deal. This is being done at, uh, on the behest of the EU, but uh, the borderline here is uh, quite uh, sensitive and uh, the U.S. intelligence has a very clear view of uh, President Putin as wanting to double down, that they are expecting uh, ever worse. What surprises the Americans uh, is that the Russians have not done more as yet. Uh, general expectation was that they would use Air Force very heavily and take out the Ukrainian Air Force, which has not been done, which is uh, a, a quite uh, quite a, a surprise. And I should also mention that the Nord Stream 2 was a major source of irritation here. Uh, basically, the Democrats and the Republicans uh, in the Congress wanted to stop it. And the, the administration spent a lot of effort in order to have their Democrats not voting for uh, 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 full binding sanctions on Nord Stream 2. But now uh, President Biden has imposed that uh, thanks to uh, uh, Chancellor um, Schultz uh, t turning around. So now it's all happy. Everybody's for uh, Duke. And it's uh, only a question of trying to avoid so that the Russians don't get uh, too upset uh, about uh, too much uh, NATO-like activity. Okay, 
Uh, thank you for this report from Washington. Uh, you are a specialist for economic and financial questions. And uh, European Union on the one hand, and especially also uh, the Washington administration uh, decided or in the status of deciding uh, quite a program of sanctions and uh, financial, using financial instruments also uh, in order to react to the invasion uh, in Ukraine. What are the effects, short time effects? Do the sanctions work? The European ones, uh, the American ones, uh, how do you see long time effects of those sanction uh, programs and also uh, the whole economic situation? The effect uh, seems to become enormous and hold. So but what has been particularly remarkable now is that the US and the EU have acted very much together. I would say that Britain has not been equally involved. And uh, the surprise here in Washington is that the European Union now has been tougher on sanctions than the US. Traditionally, it was the other way around that the US pushed for harder sanctions. Now it is the US that is lagging behind, but uh, not much. So we are seeing a, a, a great unity between these two uh, groups. And um, you can say that there are three groups of sanctions that are important. One is the financial sanctions, which are massive and uh, severe. The second is the technology sanctions. The US has now in, uh, introduced export controls on half of the technology that was previously exported uh, to Russia. In fact, it seems to become almost complete because it is, for example, uh, Apple has said, we are not going to sell anything to Russia uh, any longer. And the third sanctions are personal, Putin's uh, friends and top uh, officials and uh, oligarchs. That is the weakest card so far. And here I would expect much more to happen. On the financial sanctions, essentially you can't deal with Russia now financially. That's the, the actual uh, consequence of this. Uh, I doubt that the Russian stock market will recover uh, this time around. And uh, we are now seeing that uh, the, the only place where you can trade with uh, Ukrainian uh, Russian stocks is in London where 31 companies are traded, but it makes no sense for the owners of these companies because the prices are uh, extremely low and it, it seems that they can only fall more. And uh, the ruble is down 30% uh, so far. I would expect that it will fall uh, much more. So uh, what we have, uh, have seen from uh, Monday is a complete financial panic in uh, Moscow. And since uh, there won't be any easing up of the sanctions, uh, it, is, uh, it will get worse and uh, worse. So I would expect, um, I will mention the ruble fall by half, uh, and uh, as it did in 2014, by the way, but then it recovered quite a bit afterward. I would not expect that this time. And then we would see inflation shooting up, say by at least 20%, it could be more and the Russians will feel that they are getting much poorer. The question is how much GDP will fall. It fell by 2.5% in 2015, by 5% in 98. I would guess that it will be at least 5% now, and it could be um, much more. So we are seeing real panic, and we're also seeing that um, Western companies are trying to withdraw as fast as possible. BP, Shell, and Exxon, the three Thank biggest you. foreign investors uh, have already said that they are w w withdrawing. And I saw today in the news that Raiffeisen Bank uh, is uh, considering whether uh, to depart from Moscow, where they have been for 30 years. Uh, so when you get sanctions, uh, you get first um, the sanction risk. The companies never know when uh, the sanctions will turn worse. So they stay away from the, uh, because of the sanction risk, financial and credit risk, because you can't get insurance in these circumstances or insurance is very expensive. And then you have reputation risk. 
because normally with sanctions you get a lot of criminal activity to avoid the sanctions, which is very dangerous. So lots of companies are voluntarily then staying away so that the sanctions become self-reinforcing. So to conclude, sanctions are vicious and they are far more effective than understood. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. May, let me uh, let, let, uh, let, let, uh, Ambassador, to continue just from your point of view and your experience uh, in Moscow and also in Ukraine, how do you see that? Uh, maybe also if you can answer a little bit, you know, how far do you think has Russia uh, been able to reach its goals by now? Well, um, first let me add to uh, what uh, uh, Professor Oslo just uh, said about uh, uh, the, the sanctions and uh, uh, Europe and Austria. Yesterday, uh, the uh, CEO of Raiffeisen in, on Austrian TV uh, made it uh, clear, Strobel, that uh, they will continue in Russia and they, that they don't uh, want to uh, close down the bank. But uh, today, uh, Sperbank Europe, uh, which has its headquarters in Vienna, has filed bankruptcy, uh, insolvency, and, that, uh, and they uh, have to be bailed out, actually, uh, by the Austrian uh, bank mechanisms for bailing out banks. Uh, and uh, this is already decided. So that's quite an, an, an interesting uh, uh, development. Uh, Sperbank uh, Austria uh, is not so much uh, uh, Sperbank Europe with its headquarters in Austria, is not so much active on the Austrian market, but on the German market. Uh, and uh, but still, the other Austrian banks uh, will bail out uh, Sperbank uh, Europe uh, for this uh, ins insolvency. So I think uh, that's quite an interesting uh, development. <clears throat> what the Russians want to achieve that is uh, interesting. Also, uh, yesterday I mentioned it before um, in this call that uh, Putin had uh, with uh, the Venezuelan president Maduro, and. Um, they uh, repeated, uh, and he repeated uh, his, uh, you know, goals that he wants to have. And let me read them to you. It's the recognition of the uh, People's Republics of Lugansk and Donetsk in the borders of the two oblasts, i.e. not uh, what uh, it was uh, uh, during, you know, the, the period up to uh, the invasion, uh, but they want to have the whole oblast, which is uh, the 60 percent uh, more of the of the whole territory, uh, and they have to be recognized by Kiev. Then also the uh, recognition of Russian sovereignty over Crimea, demilitarization, and denazification of the Ukrainian state, uh, and then uh, a safeguard of the Ukrainian neutral and non-nuclear status. This is what he. Uh, this is what he said uh, to Maduro. Now, um, if these are the goals, and uh, if this is what uh, uh, he uh, expects to uh, achieve, uh, then it will be uh, difficult with uh, the president president of uh, Ukraine, Zelensky, uh, because I don't see uh, many points on which he could, uh, so to say, come forward uh, for uh, for the with the Russian uh, interests, and. Uh, Yes, he had spoken about the possibility of Ukraine becoming uh, a neutral country. Uh, but uh, and, uh, Ukraine has already been a non-nuclear country uh, since 1994 uh, with the uh, Budapest Memorandum. Uh, and uh, now what uh, the Kremlin is claiming that uh, Lavrov said it also uh, yesterday that uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, become a nuclear power again. Uh, nobody has ever observed this before. Uh, and uh, uh, I think you have all seen this uh, very uh, interesting uh, scene uh, when uh, uh, Lavrov addressed uh, the, uh, the UN uh, Commission on, on Human Rights in Geneva uh, with this uh, incredible walkout. Uh, so hardly anybody listened to Lavrov uh, anymore. And this speaks also of a certain isolation. 
of Russia internationally. Uh, the other uh, questions of uh, demilitarization of Ukraine, what does that mean of a territory of uh, 600,000 square kilometers? Uh, if you take away Crimea and uh, what were the People's Republics, the so-called People's Republics before, uh, you, you have to deduct 40,000 uh, square kilometers roughly. So we still have 560,000 square kilometers. How do you demilitarize this? And how do you actually also then control it? And what does the denazification of Ukraine mean? Uh, the, uh, in, the, in the last rather elections, the right-wing parties at uh, 300,000 votes. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, just uh, non-existent. And uh, with a president who certainly is everything else but a Nazi uh, with his personal background. Uh, so I think uh, uh, this is just uh, uh, one of the uh, questions that one asks oneself, how can they uh, accept this? And if, as I uh, uh, mentioned before, uh, there are st still fighting going on in the eastern part of Ukraine, at the, in the uh, oblasts of Donetsk and Lugansk. So how can uh, a Ukrainian president accept uh, uh, recognizing uh, the uh, so-called People's Republics in the, terri in the territory of the whole oblast now that there is still fighting going on. Uh, so I think uh, that uh, are demands uh, that uh, certainly cannot be met and, uh, can, and I think Russia knows that very well. So the yeah. question still, still is, what are they actually expecting? Uh, and uh, what what have has been their aim? And uh, with the uh, now uh, with the uh, acts that they have done, also in in Kharkiv, uh, with uh, you know bombing, uh, destroying the center, or also uh, you know the uh, demolition uh, on the military activities uh, in the Holocaust uh, near the Holocaust monument, Babi Yar, uh, near Kiev, is just a disaster. Uh, a disaster uh, of, uh, of a campaign, uh, and uh, it is also, let's put it that way, an international PR disaster uh, that nobody will ever understand and nobody ever will accept these kind of acti activities uh, from uh, the Russian army. Yeah, it certainly uh, is a situation that obviously is looking quite different to uh, the strategic goals of Moscow. I mean, it looked to me when they started the invasion just uh, a week ago, you know, that they wanted to get control all over Ukraine and especially dominate the whole uh, Black Sea coast region and uh, at least the eastern parts of uh, Ukraine and also the capital Kiev. Uh, but obviously it is not so easy. And what I see is, you know, that uh, as you called it, uh, international reaction is quite different. I have not met anybody in the last days, diplomats from all over the world and also simple people. And uh, everybody just talked about this more or less historic situation uh, because people obviously feel that this invasion has changed politics uh, quite a bit. And therefore, uh, I would like to ask the question. For me, it uh, looks so that uh, Putin has more or less isolated Russia from Central and Western European countries, from the rest of Europe. And insofar, the question is, what will be the alternative for his politics in the future? Uh, what are the consequences of this self-isolation of uh, Russia's politics? And may I ask uh, Professor Yu this question and maybe also a consideration of this general tendency and uh, global attitude versus uh, this invasion? Yeah, I think that you are completely uh, right. Uh, Russia has really isolated itself very heavily. And of course, uh, uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Saidik and I work together in, 
in Moscow in the mid 80s, and we were then used to an extreme rudeness from the Soviet authorities. And Putin has not only restored this rudeness, but he has even reinforced it. And people don't like rude uh, people who uh, uh, lie to you all the time. So this is uh, really quite bad for your uh, diplomacy. And the, the big idea that has been on the table is that Russia would um, uh, get closer to China. And in particular here in the National Security Council in the US, the idea was clearly we should be soft on Russia in order not to get Russia and China together. And what we have seen and are seeing now is this is completely wrong. The tougher the US and Western policy is on uh, Russia, the further the Chinese stay away from it. I have one good example. Uh, at the end of May 2014, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin agreed that uh, the Chinese state banks should deliver $25 billion in credits for the big gas pipeline uh, power of Siberia, to, which uh, has been built to go to China. And uh, in July 2014, the US uh, uh, first and then the EU introduced hard sanctions, financial sanctions on uh, Russia. And then the four big Chinese state banks said, we are not going to give a cent to Russia because we don't want to risk uh, US sanctions against ourselves. And I think that with these uh, horrendous Western sanctions now on Russia, the Chinese will be very careful so that these sanctions don't hit China. It's true that there are other Western sanctions on China, but China does not want to be punished because of Russia. Uh, so uh, it takes other sanction risks, but not the Russian uh, uh, sanction uh, risks. And all of a sudden now we see this the argument has disappeared in the uh, uh, quiet, informal uh, Was Washington uh, uh, discussion. Uh, so it's uh, quite a different uh, situation. The other countries, of course, India, and the Indians are never saying anything uh, negative about Russia because this is their old ally, but they're not doing anything more either. They are used to buy a lot of uh, uh, military equipment from uh, uh, Russia, but uh, there's, n n n there's rather less and it's not uh, uh, de de developing. And these are the two big states. And then, of course, we have Iran, Venezuela, uh, North Korea, and we have a sort of uh, axis of the robes uh, in uh, the outsiders. Yeah. Uh, talking about energy politics, you know, uh, we're in a situation that most uh, or that all of the European countries decided, you know, more or less uh, to lessen the dependence uh, on oil and gas and try to go uh, in, in an enforced way into uh, renewable energies in order uh, to reach our climate goals. And now we have the situation that in addition to it, you know, there is more or less an attitude not uh, to be as dependent as Europe used to be uh, up to now on, your, on uh, Russian oil and gas. And this will mean that uh, the Russian exports of oil and gas are endangered by two sides. On the one hand, climate policy, and on the other hand, also this sanctions or reaction policy of a Western state. And if, I, if I'm looking, you know, uh, to uh, Russian exports, uh, what I found out a few years ago, which really was surprising for me, you know, when you take away uh, oil and gas exports from the Russian export statistics, the size of Russian exports is in between Switzerland and Austria. It's not exports of a big power, but just uh, a small or medium-sized country. And insofar, the question will come uh, up to me, you know, what will be the long-term 
uh, consequences of uh, this reorientation of European energy policy. How do you see that? Yeah, on Professor. the oil, for, for me, yes. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I think uh, that on oil, it's not so sensitive. Uh, Russia produces approximately 12% of all global oil production. It's 50% of uh, Russia's uh, exports. And strangely, oil is relatively unpolitical. And uh, uh, it will be needed for vehicles. Essentially, oil is now being used uh, for tr uh, transportation. Uh, and uh, I, I think that it's not such a big problem. Gas is strangely much more political, while it's slightly more than 10% of Russian exports. What Russia did last year is that they cut their exports to the European Union by about one quarter. That means 10% of the normal demand of uh, gas uh, to Europe was not delivered by uh, Gazprom. And this is quite serious. I would presume that the European uh, uh, Commission would bring the, this up and uh, I would presume that we will see a change in the European uh, gas policy uh, with two major uh, factors. One is that it's quite strange that Gazprom owns a lot of uh, uh, gas storage in Austria, Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, it, it's uh, in line with the third energy package of 2009, it would be natural if a supplier is not allowed to own uh, gas storage in the country. It should be independent. It's a s s sort of in line with the uh, principle of unbundling. Similarly, Qatar owns uh, much of the storage in Britain. And exactly as Gazprom, they had left these uh, uh, storages almost uh, empty. So this is one uh, substantial improvement that needs to be done. Uh, prohibit uh, uh, suppliers uh, to own uh, storage in the uh, uh, country of final destination. The other is uh, more LNG, and I think this is happening in any case. In particular in the US, uh, the production of LNG is developing very fast, also in uh, the US. And of course, uh, uh, as you mentioned, renewable energy will be coming. But uh, for uh, Western dependence on Russia, this is curious because Russia is a major producer of almost all the metals you need for electrical vehicles. And uh, this will be a very interesting development to see. And it would be very unfortunate if uh, Russia cannot develop uh, the production of these uh, metals that uh, we need so, uh, so badly, and the West should certainly not shoot itself in the foot by prohibiting uh, these exports. So my essence is that there will be some changes in gas policy, hardly anything in oil policy, apart from the big Western uh, oil companies now buying and large uh, disinvesting in uh, uh, Russia. Well, it seems like a French Total will uh, stay in Novatec, where they own uh, almost one fifth of the uh, stocks. But Novatec, which is seen as a crony company here in the Washington, uh, might very well be sanctioned by, by the Americans. And for Europe, it doesn't much matter otherwise, because uh, uh, Novatec exports its uh, gas as LNG to China by and large. So it has very little impact on the, the, the European uh, uh, situation. Okay, yeah, maybe Ambassador Seidig, uh, we are informed about discussions in Germany on uh, energy policy and also on security policy. Uh, where do you see major changes in uh, European politics, energy uh, and security policy? I think uh, what uh, Professor Osmond has uh, already said is um, very important uh, to understand uh, that uh, we have to divide and have a different approach uh, as to oil and as to gas. And, uh, and oil is non-political, gas is 
much more political. I think uh, Professor Oslund is very, very right. And this is also important uh, for, you know, my now answer uh, to your question as uh, what is the in, in the European market going on. Um, I think uh, uh, first, first uh, it's important to uh, note that uh, the, the biggest Austrian company, OMV, uh, which is, uh, you know, in an oil and gas company, OMV had decided uh, today uh, to uh, uh, give back uh, its share uh, in a, a big gas field uh, in, in, uh, in the Barents Sea in the development. And uh, so this will, uh, they will not continue. They will keep uh, one other share uh, in the gas field, but not uh, this new uh, development. So they uh, will move out of this. And uh, this is a major Austrian decision also that it is important. But uh, as Professor Oslund spoke about the storage, also here we have an interesting development in Austria. We don't have a law on the storage of gas. Uh, and uh, we have a law on the storage of oil, but we don't have a law on the storage of gas. And the government now uh, realized uh, that this uh, is actually uh, a, a situation that we cannot continue with. And our Minister of uh, Energy and Environment, uh, Gebesler, yesterday announced that there will be now also uh, a law on the storage of gas, which will come effective already uh, for the next next uh, heating period uh, in autumn. And this will then uh, force Gazprom, uh, the owner of the uh, largest uh, st storage area in Austria, to uh, really provide right storage. Uh, and what they have not done, because they have basically depleted the storages. Uh, and uh, so from next year on, or from the next heating period on, uh, this will change. Another important lessons lesson that we Austrians learned very fast. Uh, it took us uh, maybe uh, it, it would have taken us years to uh, to get this lesson. Now we get it uh, very fast. Uh, gas is also important as, uh, on, on the European side for, for Russia because uh, gas is considered to be uh, still green economy by the European uh, Union. Uh, and for Russia, this would have meant uh, a long perspective uh, for gas exports uh, to Europe uh, to be part of the you know still European Green Deal. While uh, in Russia itself, uh, there has been what uh, people, uh, what uh, experts and scholars in Russia have called a green revolution uh, that has been going on in Russia with uh, the major actors, you know, like Gazprom, Rosneft, uh, and uh, Novatek also, but also other companies realizing that they have to go also into renewables uh, and uh, that they have to reorient uh, their, uh, their uh, strategies. And this has been a, what, uh, a major revolution, uh, actually uh, with the benediction of Putin. Um, and uh, this would have been an interesting development also because it would have opened many, many new areas for cooperation uh, between uh, Russia and Europe, and also probably the United States, but uh, especially Europe uh, with uh, technologies for renewables going into Russia. Uh, and uh, but uh, this for sure uh, will find um, not uh, doesn't will not have a great future now. Let me come to uh, what you discussed before a little bit on, on China. Uh, there's an interesting there was a, a call yesterday uh, between the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi and the uh, uh, Ukrainian foreign minister. Um, and uh, according to the Ukrainian foreign ministry, the press release by the Ukrainian foreign ministry, we don't know whether this is really true. Uh, the Wang Yi spoke out for this in, in, uh, support of the sovereignty and territorial in integrity of Ukraine. Uh, and that is quite uh, important to notice. Uh, now, uh, this uh, call uh, by uh, the uh, Chinese foreign minister. And he was also asking uh, the uh, Ukrainians uh, to help them uh, to uh, get, uh, there are about 6,000 Chinese living in Ukraine uh, to evacuate uh, these 6,000 Chinese. And uh, Kuleba 
is that the best way uh, to uh, have them safe is uh, for uh, Wang Yi to call the Russians uh, to stop the, uh, the, you know, the military activities. Then uh, this is all according to uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian foreign ministry. Uh, but I think what what he, you know I think one should uh, look a, a little bit forward, and uh, that the Chinese are uh, now calling and making this public. Uh, I would not rule out that the Chinese would like to go into mediation in this conflict, and this would be a very interesting, completely new development uh, if the Chinese would get into the mediation in Europe uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and uh, let's not rule out that this is possible uh, and that is that the Chinese might want to become a player, uh, a, a positive player uh, in Europe. Yeah, maybe surprising <laughs> developments. On the other hand, of course, uh, when there is self-isolation from the Russian side, uh, Putin will be more or less uh, be eager, you know, to get even closer to Beijing. And insofar, I also wanted uh, to ask uh, Velina. Uh, Velina, you talked quite a lot already about this uh, Sino-Russian relationship, uh, about the so-called Dragon Bear uh, informal alliance and maybe uh, even consequences uh, in security policy if you are thinking or talking about Taiwan. How do you see that? Well, in fact, uh, if we go back a little bit uh, to uh, the first invasion of Russia uh, of uh, Ukraine by Russia in 2014 um, and uh, recall how actually the Ukraine, uh, you know, the Ukrainian crisis created a serious, significant, in fact, economic and financial crisis for Russia, where the Russian uh, currency was uh, worst off uh, even in a a uh, worse position than the Ukrainian currency during that time. It was, in fact, China which stepped in and basically prevented uh, Russia from a default scenario similar to the 1998 crisis. Um, and I'm saying this uh, before I actually outline my um, assessment on the current uh, uh, situation following the war that uh, Russia launched against Ukraine on February 24 to uh, exemplify a uh, relationship which has become so comprehensive that I don't think that anybody really understands the complexity behind it. And of course, we can uh, bring in a lot of uh, historical arguments uh, why these two um, actors would not uh, come together and will never enter an alliance. But I would argue that, in fact, they do not need an alliance. What they have created since 2014 is what I call the dragon bear that means not an alliance nor an intent. It means a modus vivendi of systemic coordination in all relevant strategic domains. Of course, the most relevant ones being uh, economic trade and uh, financial sectors, moving through the energy and the commodities in general, which is going to be very important for China, which does not intend to decarbonize by 2050, but uh, is going to uh, need uh, commodities, uh, including the Russian ones, for a longer, prolonged uh, decarbonization by 2060, probably even longer. And, uh, of course, then we go to the technological sector. We are in the middle of a fourth industrial revolution in which uh, the United States and China are already competing over the superiority in the technological domain. And once again, uh, Russia sees itself on uh, siding with uh, China because of the hunger for uh, technologies. And finally, of course, defense, uh, because defense uh, is something that China will certainly lead while uh, being on the rise if Beijing really intends to strategically compete with the United States. Now, following this wrap-up, um, a two-front diplomatic scenario in which Russia's position on Taiwan and China's position on Ukraine have been mutually coordinated uh, 
uh, in fact created a kind of a new level of uh, confrontation during the military escalation already in December. And I already stated in December that we will not see a military uh, attack. Uh, nobody, in fact, was expecting a full-fledged uh, war, but I did, uh, in fact, expect uh, a military um, attack uh, by Russia, military reinvasion in eastern Ukraine. And I argued that this one will not happen before the end of uh, the Olympic Games. And it was the case because we saw on 24th of February uh, at uh, 4 um, a.m. in the morning this war began and was launched by Moscow in an unprovoked manner against Ukraine. Now Russia also what I think is going to be relevant for the future um, is important that China considers uh, Russia's strategic space, uh, China considers Russia's security concerns uh, and China's uh, and Russia's strategic space which includes the near abroad. It has been actually verbally um, pointed out uh, several times already during the military escalation and at the very same time of course Moscow is going to be expected to consider uh, China's strategic space where of course in Taiwan and in the South China Sea in the future. Now parallels were drawn between Russia's actions in Ukraine and China's claims on Taiwan and the Taiwanese government uh, in fact condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine, emphasizing the differences between the situation um, in Taiwan as compared to Ukraine. Uh, the Chinese official positions on uh, the war against Ukraine however remained as we know even though that there were some cases as the one uh, Ambassador Seidig uh, provided uh, with the call between uh, Chinese and Ukrainian officials but in reality the Chinese position remained very vague while uh, they uh, even refused to uh, call it an invasion and in reality it is uh, quite obvious that uh, China is siding with uh, Russia following this uh, uh, reinvasion. Why we already observed uh, in several diplomatic uh, arenas how China supported uh, the Russian position. Uh, the, of course, the milestone uh, which is important to be mentioned uh, and it will have a relevance uh, for uh, the future developments in this relationship and also for the global order in general is the signing of the joint declaration on February 4th where in fact uh, the Russian side reaffirmed and it stays in the text reaffirmed the support for the one China principle confirming that Taiwan is uh, an in alienable part of China uh, while opposing any forms of independence of Taiwan. It's interesting, however, that Ukraine hasn't been mentioned. What was mentioned in the joint declaration uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, the joint opposition, that means China and Russia opposing further enlargement of NATO. And here, once again, we can find actually quite of a strict coordination of positions when it comes to Russia's claims. Let me remind you that they are still on the table. Russia's claims um, against uh, United States, so basically the claims to, which were uh, posted to the United States and NATO when it comes to Russia's security concerns. So obviously there is a kind of coordinated opposition when it comes to US-led geopolitical blocs because uh, furthermore uh, in uh, the joint declaration it says that both are also uh, opposed to any geopolitical blocs while naming some of them uh, such as uh, AUKUS and Quad, which are the new US-led uh, initiatives, geopolitical initiatives in the Indo-Pacific. So, in a sense, uh, I argue that uh, we cannot uh, draw a parallel between Taiwan and Ukraine. Taiwan is not Ukraine as a scenario. This is very important to understand. Irrespective of any official statements, of course, we also need to understand the real political calculations behind it because the, um, the true uh, intentions are never, uh, never um, explained uh, and we need to understand, of course, the rationale behind it. Uh, I argue that uh, Beijing will not make a move on Taiwan following the war by Russia against Ukraine, uh, specifically now before the very important Congress of the Communist Party in September this year, where 
there might be some uh, kind of military tensions uh, as a foreign policy, uh, so to say, outcome, which Xi Jinping could use to capitalize on before the Congress, I see as a potential terrain rather uh, India-China tensions yeah. than actually a yeah. military attack on uh, Taiwan. Okay, thank you. We are in the middle of security policy and of alliances. Uh, Ambassador Seidig, uh, how do we see the consequences of this Russian invasion of Ukraine for European uh, security and defense policy? Is this a new momentum? Is this a new development? If you look to the discussions in Germany and in other countries, even in Austria, uh, what is your judgment? What is your analysis? I think you you are right. Uh, there are there are uh, very interesting developments in the past days. Let's put it that way. We, I would call it discussions, because uh, I and uh, the so new uh, areas that one are covered by discussions, uh, what one would have not expected before. Um, take our country, for instance, Austria. Uh, there is now uh, there seems to be an understanding by all uh, parliamentary parties uh, that uh, uh, much more money has to be spent on defense. But uh, I think, uh, again, we have to wait until this is implemented uh, and this will take time. So this is an intention that it doesn't mean that there will be more money for defense. Uh, second, um, we have these discussions and uh, uh, Professor Oslo, this is sweet, uh, will know this uh, very well uh, about you know the relationship of uh, Sweden with with NATO. I in the discussions that there is should Sweden uh, join NATO or not, and we have uh, the same interesting uh, discussions even uh, stronger now in Finland with also uh, the uh, Finnish. Uh, Prime Minister Marin talking about uh, this issue that this is an that this is a question that has to be considered. Um, there was the reaction from Moscow right away, which was negative, but we have a new discussion. It doesn't mean that Finland will join NATO. It doesn't mean that Sweden will join NATO. Uh, we are only in a discussion phase. In Germany, we have the discussions phase that now the German. Uh, government with the Greens in power, with the Social Democrats, uh, who have always been uh, very reticent on spending more money on defense, now saying, yes, we will spend more money on defense. But again, uh, let's see what will be the reality. Uh, and uh, what are the, what we have, these are all discussions, uh, and uh, we will have to look in, in two, three months half a year, what will then really be the result on paper? Uh, and uh, But uh, already the fact that we have these discussions is very interesting. What I would hope for, honestly, is that we also have a discussion on the future of the European Union and that we understand uh, that uh, we have to, uh, that we cannot stop enlarging the European Union. Uh, and that the European Union uh, has to be and has to function also with more members than just 28. Who says that if the European Union has 32 members, uh, that it will function worse than with 28? Uh, so also here, uh, I, I remember very well uh, in uh, the 90s uh, of uh, last century, uh, when uh, Austria, Sweden and Finland applied uh, for membership in the European Union, three neutral countries, uh, that in, in, in France, uh, the law uh, was of the opinion, well, this is, this is impossible because how can uh, the European Union, the European community then digest all this? Uh, and we have to deepen our, you know, our uh, cooperation and uh, be deepening, more deepening before enlarging. Uh, and we have now the same discussion, uh, and, uh, and, but uh, we still have to finally uh, continue 
we cannot leave countries like Montenegro, Albania, uh, Northern Macedonia, Serbia, Bosnia, out of the European Union. Uh, we have to find a way. And if this uh, situation that we have now with Ukraine uh, uh, triggers also this understanding, then wonderful. And we have to also answer the question, can uh, Ukraine become a member of the European Union? And uh, last but not least, uh, Turkey. We are in the 59th year of the membership perspective of Turkey. Uh, we, are think we are about to finally give an answer uh, and not to uh, you know, hand this question over to our grandchildren. Uh, I think this is unfair to Turkey. And if the situation that we are in now uh, triggers also this discussion on this, and not only how to defend ourselves better and how to spend more money on defense, I think this will make us even much stronger. Yeah, thank you. I think it was a highly interesting uh, proposal coming from uh, Ursula von der Leyen that she more or less offered uh, EU membership in the future uh, for Ukraine. And even if there is a consensus that this, of course, will take time, even uh, if there should be a special uh, way of joining EU, but still it would mean, of course, uh, a long period of adjustment and so on. Uh, but besides the European uh, situation on security and defense, uh, Professor Osland, how do you see uh, the development within the Western community uh, between United States and the European countries? Uh, the status of NATO that uh, not so long ago uh, was called by the French president uh, as a brain death organization. Uh, is there any new moment you can see, not only from Scandinavian point of view, but also from a transatlantic uh, view to the uh, outcoming of this situation? Well, <clears throat> the Biden administration has really emphasized cooperation with the European Union very strongly. And I think that we are seeing that. To begin with, there was a certain confusion in the new administration that they thought that Europe was Germany. But now we are seeing more that it's uh, the European Union. I'm thinking particularly on the sanctions cooperation that I mentioned uh, before, where we see very strong cooperation. So as long as Biden and his administration stays, the US is more positive on Europe than ever. And uh, this discussion about NATO, it's not really uh, a, comp a competition given that the Western unity is uh, uh, so big. Uh, Query is, of course, uh, uh, the position of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has been much more forward uh, leaning when it comes to military support for Ukraine, but it's lagging behind when it comes to uh, sanctions on, uh, on Russia. So this is a, com a complication. And of course, uh, here in Washington, one also looks up on Canada that is by and large following the, uh, the US lead on uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, issues. But uh, the big uh, worry is, of course, if uh, Trump in any way would come back uh, in three years' time, and, uh, two and a half years' time, that would be truly scary. But uh, that remains to be seen. OK, yeah. So. Uh... Let us come maybe to the last round. And my last question would be, uh, how do you see the consequences of this Russian invasion, which is characterized by most people, in, at least in Western Europe, as more or less uh, an activity that resembles uh, great power politics in the 19th century uh, and will not have a place in the 21st century? Uh, what does it mean uh, in the relationship between democracies? You know, uh, Ambassador Sadiq, you pointed out that Zelensky was elected democratically by 73% uh, of the population. And uh, I mean, does it also mean that uh, this will have an influence 
and the relationship between democracies on the one hand and uh, authoritarian uh, regimes and uh, governments at the other side, uh, is there a global effect or do we overestimate the importance of this uh, invasion at the moment for world politics? Maybe we start out uh, with Ambassador uh, Sadik. I think uh, that uh, this uh, move uh, by the Russian side has, uh, as clearly as it uh, could ever be, uh, shown uh, the difference in values. And uh, we uh, are uh, different, uh, we are oriented towards different values. And uh, our societies are oriented towards different values. And uh, international politics is often a very dialectical process. Uh, so I think uh, we can be uh, maybe grateful uh, to Mr. Putin uh, that he uh, made us understand our European societies again, how it important is to have societies you know, based on these democratic values. And that a country like Ukraine uh, with its uh, population of over 40 million wants to preserve this and that the population is ready to fight for this and to to fight for and, and to really lose the lives and the, the people not only uh, we speak about people who uh, now leave and flee Ukraine but we also should speak about many many uh, especially men who return to Ukraine or who stay in Ukraine uh, in order to fight, to fight for the values, to fight for a different society. And uh, I think here we have it very clear. We have two countries operating on, uh, let's put it mildly, a different uh, system of values now in Europe, uh, which is Russia and Belarus. Uh, and then there is another word. We have actually not spoken very much about uh, Belarus today, uh, which uh, is also, uh, I would say, uh, we should not overlook the role of Belarus in this conflict, unfortunately. Um, but there is also a role there. But here we are again back to values. And uh, what I fear is that, uh, I hope I'm wrong, that the developments that now uh, take place with this uh, armed conflict will not lead uh, in Russia uh, to a further uh, more undemocratic uh, society from our point of view uh, uh, than uh, we see it in Russia now. Uh, and that uh, people who uh, had uh, the courage to criticize Putin's policy, speak out to post uh, their opinion uh, in, in the social networks, that these people will not be punished. But what we see now is that uh, uh, one uh, TV station has been closed, Dost, which was an uh, you know, alternative uh, TV station, one alternative radio station, uh, Echo Moskvi, closed. Um, where will this go to? Where will this lead to in Russia? Uh, and uh, will the society in Russia accept this? Uh, and uh, we will see. Uh, and uh, but, but the fear is uh, that uh, the, the difference in practiced values, the gap between Western Europe and Russia and Belarus will probably become wider. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, before I give the last word uh, to Professor Aslund, I would like uh, to announce our next, uh, not EIS talk, but our next bigger event in next week. Uh, it will be the theme, the issue of Indo-Pacific, the new global gravitation center. 
and it will be a bigger international event in at Diplomatic Academy. We have invited specialists from uh, Paris, from Berlin and from Brussels, and of course also from Austria. And we will discuss uh, the importance of this new global gravitation center uh, since the beginning of the 20th century and what it will mean for European politics. So far next Wednesday, 6 p.m. at Diplomatic Academy, and we probably also will uh, present it uh, virtually. Uh, and this brings me to the moment where I, before I want to thank you, I just ask uh, Professor Aslund, uh, how do you see uh, this situation of global development or the influence of Russia's invasion uh, into Ukraine, consequences for global politics, for global developments? Yeah, no, I basically agree with everything what uh, uh, Ambassador Seidek uh, said, but I think that this is a massive dividing line. And uh, as it looks now, I see essentially two uh, uh, scenarios uh, for this war. Putin has established a system with weak presidents dependent on him in uh, Belarus and also in Kazakhstan, even if Kazakhstan is not fully under Russian mm -hmm. control. And he wants to have the same system in Ukraine. He doesn't want to have a real um, a country that uh, can stand up, but he wants to have a, a protectorate. And uh, this will be very bloody. I don't think that he will succeed, uh, but this can take long time. The other alternative is that President Putin disappears somehow. I'm not, I'm not going to predict uh, how, but this is the alternative. And then I think that his uh, system will just collapse because it's uh, based on the institutionalization and uh, Russians are brave, well-educated and uh, are not likely to take this uh, nonsense forever. But uh, the repression, uh, as Ambassador Seidek elaborated on, seems to get, be getting worse and uh, worse. Uh, so uh, I very much try to look up on what is happening inside Russia, but we have very little information, unfortunately, uh, about it. So these are the two uh, alternatives, a very bloody uh, repressive mess or a collapse in the Putin system. Mm -hmm. Okay, then in the name of Elina Chakharova and me for AIS, I really want to thank you uh, for joining us today and for discussing not only uh, facts and developments, newest developments of this invasion, but also the strategic consequences. And uh, I, I really, I'm tending to call them, it probably will be historic, uh, what we are experiencing at the moment. It will change the situation in within Europe fundamentally, and maybe it also will change quite a bit uh, the global situation. And insofar, I really want to thank you, Professor Osland, for your participation and for your uh, really uh, highly interesting and uh, and valuable uh, contributions, your analysis, uh, expertise you brought into our discussion, and just the same also to Ambassador Seidig and of course also to our director, Velina uh, Chakharova. In this sense, uh, thank you so much. All the best to you and hopefully see you soon again uh, in discussing maybe or hopefully better situations than we are confronted uh, with at the moment. All the best. And uh, by that, I will finish our today's AIES talk. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Very thank nice. you very much. Thank you.